Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Intelligent Insight Driven Policing. I'm Michael Sudmar with MC Plus A. I'm joined by Simon Taylor and Ian Williams. Simon's with LucidWorks and Ian's with Toronto Police. Now I'd like to allow Simon and Ian to introduce themselves. Starting with Simon. Hey, thanks, Michael. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, so I, I run all of our channel and partners at LucidWorks. Um, pleased to join today. We've got a really interesting set of content here, but um, just in the context of, of MC plus A and Toronto Police, we've been heavily involved in, in everything uh, these guys have been doing as they try and bring to light uh, an, a new approach to, to insights for policing. So yeah, I'm very keen to see how what questions come up today and, and, and see, what people, um, see what people think of the content. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Williams, the Manager of Analytics and Innovation with the Toronto Police Service. We're happy to be here to discuss some of the work we've been doing with MC Plus A and LucidWorks around our global search platform, which has a lot of potential even based on where we've come so far. And so we'll talk a little bit about that journey and where we see the opportunities from here. Thank you. Okay, so let's make a start then. So in terms of the agenda for today, we're focusing very much on framing our discussion around insights into three core areas, which is the first one is to do with incident reporting and how a number of different trends and directions are, are forcing police forces, LEAs, to go and think about how they streamline um, their incident reporting and, and particularly around looking at legacy content sources on legacy systems. The second one is more about uh, the proactive integration of, uh, of what's going on in the community today and how that can improve the way we anticipate a particular scenario that a police officer will be facing, or more importantly, uh, trends and directions and thought and sentiment that's going on in the communities that police officers face. And then the third area is it's just something we wanted to touch on towards the end, which is we live in a very different world today. A lot of, a lot of our police officers are, are on the front line are put, put into challenging situations and, and therefore suffer from a, as a result of that. And really some of the more of the HR type aspects or things that relate to really supporting a police officer in the right way and so that we can gain from more insightful approaches. So this is really sort of three areas and there's a lot of great content in this and I would really urge people as we go through this to ask questions as well or we can wait till the end as well. Just in terms of slides though, the first thing I sort of really wanted to talk about very much is, is really a couple of directional pieces of information that we've we've gained from a lot of the analyst research that we, we tend to do with these types of sessions. And um, what's very impactful is the fact that if we look at then all the things that um, LEAs are thinking about today, there's two things that really jump to the top of that uh, whole list of topics of technology innovation. And of course, th there's lots of things like body cameras, there's lots of things like GPS tracking and, and all sorts of other things that relate to analytical views of data. But number one and two were very much around unified information platforms for, for sharing, for a consolidation of, of, of information to create a search or some other insight into policing content. And then secondly, there was a huge emphasis on social media, which is the integration not only of ways in which police forces and organizations can communicate out, but also the way that they can capture in sentiment and other feeds from communities as well, so they can better understand the public are being um, supported. So the HIST was a bit of research from the DOJ back in 2017, highlighting that these two areas were the most important and that, that a lot of police forces should focus on. And, and here we are today, and more than ever, they, they are definitely some of the, the top priorities. And you'll see a theme in here, I'll let Ian jump in in a second, but of course, of the, some of the things that Toronto Police were facing, a, a lot of it came down to how do we integrate all this information into a, a very uh, useful platform. That's right from our side. It's um, We'd been planning to do that for quite some time and it took us a while and a lot of, I'll say, failed attempts to try to get to where we are presently. And, uh, and even today, I think we're just scratching the surface, which I'd expect a lot of organizations would be experiencing something very similar to that. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Now, to frame this contextually, you, people tend to think about well, how, how do you approach something like this? Well it, well, it all starts with, you know, how do we get to the types of information today? And we're going to talk about this first off um, very quickly as to what it means to try and create a process where we can integrate information. But to frame this for the rest of the discussion, once we have an information model that's built from the integration of all these types of data, then we can do some wonderful things with it. And we thought we'd call this out up front as a way of, of really focusing people's minds on why we're picking some of the topics we did today, because they are really things that we can execute in a very short time frame, much more actionable insights around for, for policing today. And that's 
not just necessarily driven by the data, it's, it's the way in which we can utilize that data to create a platform that really focuses on some really intelligent policing solutions that drive operational efficiency in different parts of a policing environment. And we've sort of picked on three here, but really what we're doing is we're leveraging an overall information model that we'll talk about in a technology, which is in this case is, is the LucidWorks Fusion or equivalent platform that we then plug in different capabilities, whether it's search or machine learning or other types of insight uh, technology, including things like natural language so people can ask questions and, and be presented with really relevant content and then link that to a very specific use case. So we've got point uh, person of interest, 360. So how we look at individuals, we'll talk about that. A, a general crime search, which is to look at all of the resources in us, both legacy and current perspective as to what it's like to go and deliver that type of facility. And then more insightful elements to do with the community, which could include social media as an input as well. So we picked up sort of three different application focus areas to frame this discussion. But what that means in reality is we start to look at the sort of stepping stones. There's some very practical views as to what's, what the effort is in terms of scope. So the first one is unified incident reporting. And you know, there's, there's some directional content we'll get into in this area, but it's very much around legacy data sets, unified knowledge management and how we think about that. Um, and then there's compliance in the general industry as to what's driving that behavior. The second area is when we talk about a point, a person of interest view, we need to understand everything to do with that person, but also maybe pivot around the data set. We're going to show you an example of a piece of technology that allows you to pivot from incident to person and then look um, and, and see recommendations made of where that person, in a particular example, as a, someone that was arrested, might have actually been involved with other crime as well, just because of the dynamics that relate to that individual, where they're from, the community, the type of crime that's been involved, things like that. And another things that are indicators and recommendations around how we need to intervene. And then the third area is social and community, which is really understanding what's going on in the community, the channels that are being used, whether it's anything from Facebook to Twitter, or, or maybe it's even integration of new platforms like Patch or Neighborhood, and that really people pr promote and put comments on that often relate to crime. In fact, a town that I used to live in, and I'm based in New Jersey, in the US, nearly all the crime that was reported by individuals was on my neighbor, in many cases before they even contacted the police force, which is very interesting. So operational effectiveness comes from integrating those fees into something that LEAs can actually utilize. Now, with the next step from this really is to think about how we can get operational insight from these three things. And it doesn't, although these are three primary focus areas, it doesn't mean that we need to treat them individually because once we bring the information into an environment, we can do something with it. And that really is about process. So as people start to think about these three areas and what it means to go introduce something, then it always is about a process. And it starts with how people think about creating insight. So I know this is a bit sort of more to do with there's a view as to how people sort of maybe look at the technology, but it will give you an idea of, of, of the stepwise type of elements that are involved in as Ian was suggesting, bring information together. So first of all, it, it starts with understanding the silos of information that exist and how they can be brought together. Then it's about maybe looking at something slightly differently. And we're going to talk about a technology called indexing and um, inverted index type search that allows you to do things more quickly than, for instance, big data, data integration, or using business intelligence technology. Then it's about workflow. So how we link that to a particular scenario that links to some operational efficiency in, in a policing environment. And then how we can improve things like situation awareness, giving people the right information so that it improves officer efficiency as well as overall process. And then other types of insightful aspects that we can gain from that content that maybe we deliver through machine learning or some other type of analytics, for instance, related crime, uh, related behavioral aspects, areas for operation improvement, where we can make recommendations and so on. So this is a journey that really helps really characterize what not only police forces could go through, but also really what happens in, in general industry when people type uh, adopt insight technology. So let's pick up one of those three areas, first of all, so integrated instance reporting. And first of all, let's before I jump into you know, the, the how and the what's changing and how we approach this, and certainly give you an opportunity on, on, uh, from a Toronto perspective to, to say what they've, show what they've done. Let's just talk about some things that are, are in the industry right now. I think a lot of people will be aware that NIBRS, as a strategy from the FBI, is something that's getting introduced for almost for full compliance in January. And, and with that comes 
a unified way of reporting crime and records management, basically. But at the same time, it, it also involves depreciation and retiring of other legacy systems uh, with a view that NIBRIS becomes more of a, an informed or insightful framework for around national-based reporting of incident. So given that that's a driver anyway, giving people a perspective how much more quickly you can move to this framework, which not only satisfies FBI requirements, but also at the same time helps people understand how to get improve their own, own experiences is pretty key. So a good example there is to think about, I guess, what we're doing today or what we did in the past, where we have traditional policing systems that are separated, predictable, unified around a particular thought or workflow, functional in that respect, and therefore data is siloed in, in that particular database, versus where we live today, where the sort of insightful models we want to move to are but much more omnichannel, which are integrated into a, a multi-format, multi-database, interrelated, distributed environment where we're trying to leverage multiple connections of information at the same time to create much more accuracy and much more insight to do that. Now, the reality is in many of these scenarios for a police organization to move to that right side model where we're creating more insight, then they have to go for a very traditional data management approach, which from a big data perspective is time consuming. I mean, many of these projects as they start with, you know, things like ETL and moving data out of traditional systems and putting it into a format where you can do some analytics against it or run some searches or produce a different type of, of workplace solution can then be anywhere from nine to 12 months to two years worth of effort. And the reason why is because more of the emphasis is on the actual data and what we need to do with that data to move and manage it versus the operational perspective, which is how can we get something in the hands of people that really have the real requirements much more quickly and, and unify that data. So, one other way of thinking about this is to think about it as a, as a last mile problem. We focus too much on the left side, which is what to do with the data, and not enough side on the right side, which is to do with the operational. And a way of sort of maybe changing this paradigm a little bit is to think about what it would take not to necessarily get stuck in that particular method of doing things. And if we focus on reducing time to value, which is how do I think about what the operational view of this looks like and, and what it means to bring information together from that perspective, then we start to look at technology differently. And this is where insight technology comes in. And, and this is also where LucidWorks comes in as well. So this isn't really an infomercial for LucidWorks because obviously Toronto have, have really experienced the journey here, but it just shows you that you can take data at rest or at in operational source, index it, bring it into an environment and put it into a situation where you can utilize it much more quickly today than a traditional process of trying to bash applications and, and systems together. Um, because that's, the applications and systems are still working fairly well. It's just a case of creating that insight. Now with that, I'll ask Ian maybe to jump in a little bit to what's been going on at Toronto a little bit and, and to give you an example of the reality of doing what we've just been talking about. Absolutely. Thanks, Simon. I think what you've just heard is a very brief summary of the reality that a lot of law enforcement agencies face ours included. And in the presentation, we have, a, I think, a really concise way of explaining where we were compared to where we need to be. And that being where we had historically focused on a narrow version of the intelligence cycle, which was the, the slide where we saw one system really, and having to manually go into that system, extract insights piece by piece, put them together, assess them, package them, and then move on to another system. And the number of times that you would have to do that really exponentially added time, effort, and the likelihood of missing something as well. And when we compare that to where we are today with so many different systems, the nuances within those systems and the content that you need to be able to search it's extremely important to be able to have something like what we've implemented, call it global search, that touches on a number of operational sources of data, historical and current, and it connects those inherently for whomever the operational user is. And so when we do that, th there's a number of substantial benefits. And part of that maturity model for us has been preventing or at least limiting the number of times that our organization has to make copies of data. 
and Simon touched on it a little bit with the, the ETL process and making a copy of data so you can move it to another place, whether that's a warehouse or a data mart, and then build reporting off that. Or even just an analyst who extracts using Excel and a database connection, stores on their local computer or a local share drive, a copy of that data. Maybe they're putting it onto USB keys, transferring it across computers or sharing it with other people, potentially even in ways that you don't want them to be whatsoever. And the risk and work effort required in that is so substantial that when we look at where we are going, and in some cases where we are at Toronto Police Service today, is making available one place to search for information. And so that place, as I mentioned, we refer to as global search, which touches on uh, repositories of information. So current and historical systems, file shares, which are both investigative and administrative. And so we recognize, of course, that a lot of this use case is focused on solving crime problems and looking at crime reporting to try to understand who was the likely perpetrator of this crime. However, we realize that there's an exponential value that can come from having administrative members of the organization who can just simply search across file shares that they already have access to, but would otherwise have to go to six different places to try to get the information I need for this month's meeting on that project or that initiative. Or even, again, if we look towards members of our teams, uh, whether from an HR or a wellness perspective, being able to bring up very quickly the reviews that we've done for those people, some of the accommodations or the uh, awards that they've received. And, and maybe that's about our own awards. And to have access to that in one simple search engine makes so much efficiency reduces the copying of data, the time spent searching, and the likelihood that you're missing really important things. And, and, and that simply touches on what can you do by searching. There's obviously a lot of value in being able to connect across those systems over time, because as many organizations have established records management systems, either presently or in you know historical versions, you can only really search for things based on predefined boxes. So you can search for a surname or a given name or a date of birth, maybe all of those things, but they have to be in predefined boxes. You can only search in those particular areas. And what you're not able to do is search across records that might have multiple connections across systems uh, or even within your system. So to be able to search for names of people and uh, keywords like descriptions. And so what we've established to this point is a uh, an environment that our members can go into largely for operational insights to present to them those connections that otherwise very likely they wouldn't have even seen, or it would have taken so much manual effort and deliberate note-taking, making new data, to be able to try to generate the insight to understand what the connections across those data sources are. And so as we move forward, I think we have a, a lot of opportunity to apply some of the capabilities of this platform technology and really augment those operational insights for members of the organization, but also some of the insights that the public expects these days. And in some cases, those are gonna be search functionality. In some cases, there's an open data or open analytics need. And we have opportunities for both of those as we progress forward. Some of the, the ability of us moving from data to insight that is where we need to be. And so we're touching on that today, but there's a substantial opportunity to put operational insights in the hands of the members of our organization, where you can bring to them those operational analytics components that meet the task that they're working on at this moment. So whether that's a frontline police officer who happens to be dispatched to a call about a domestic, 
a domestic assault. And on their way to that domestic assault, your intelligent search solution could understand that you're on this call because it's recognizing that the CAD event that you've just been assigned to is of this nature, taking place at this address and possibly involving these people, your intelligent search solution should be able to recommend for you or at least advise a category of things that have occurred previously to do with these common elements, these people, this location, or domestics in generally. Maybe it's a procedure awareness component. So on your way to that event, here's a reminder about some of the procedures you should consider when going to a domestic. Do you have backup? What's your, do you have a partner? Do you have a site into this location and a site out of this location? So very operational things. If you're going to potentially a less concerning type of call, so the officer safety risk appears lower on the way to that call. So it's a mischief call or a property damage call. And you're on your way there. However, the location where that call is generated from happens to be a gang territory or happens to have a number of people who have warrants for their arrest, or has uh, people who are known to want to commit suicide by cop. There's a number of capabilities that you can generate those operational insights in real time based on data that already exists in an insightful manner. And so those are the types of things that we're working towards now to enable our members. Now, of course, you can't have 100 messages blasting to an officer on their way to a call, but there's ways that you can subtly introduce those and they can acknowledge and consume or disregard in real time in a way that's not impacting their ability to respond accordingly to that event. And so um, those are some of the approaches that we're looking at as we continue forward. And I'll pass back to Simon to discuss a little bit more about um, solutioning around some of these needs. Thanks very much, Ian. And, and you know, just, just picking up on that slide a second as well, all the things that you're focusing on right in, in today are very much on that sort of in that in that diagram right now, less to do with, hey, let's move and manage the data because it's already in a framework that you can do something with. So it's really freeing you up to go and address the real true needs of your members and, and what, what it's like to give them that insight, right? I mean, I think that's the key point that's accelerated your your ability to go and, and do things today in, in ways that you would have been more challenging previously, right? Absolutely. Great. So let's touch on a few other things to sort of sort of get to start to wrap up a little bit more of the session today. So I really wanted to spend a little bit of time on understanding the community, just because there's so many parallels with the way that we can integrate external sources of information into that model we're just talking about that would really truly enable most law enforcement agencies to really better understand some of the dynamics of the communities that they're actually supporting. And, and sort of one way of looking at this is to think about, okay, well, social media, we talked about briefly up front, but again, some research actually within the last 12 months by one of the leading analysts here really showed that almost, almost 97% of law enforcement ages use social media in one capacity or the other today. And that's to help solve crime, to help understand patterns of, um, of behavior. But you know, the way that we can pivot on that and, and use that information to better inform community, better understand community, gain an understanding of sentiment or, or what's actually going on in communities is, is just wait, is data waiting to be integrated in the type of framework that, that Ian was talking about that can in turn um, alert officers when they're, when they're in, in particular situations. So we see this as just a, a simple way of just adding another data feed or set of data feeds into that framework we're talking about. And the power then of bringing that type of content into a model where you can start to relate by person, by activity, by territory, street, location, policing district, whatever it looks like, means that we can do things that we weren't able to do as easily. For example, we can inform the community about directional things that you know would have been traditionally harder to alert. I mean, just imagine what we do with amber alerts today and silver alerts today um, being pushed out through community frameworks where we can localize more specifically where that need is versus just having it on a billboard on the highway uh, as an example. Also, we can gain public assistance more specifically in areas where we're more challenged. Um, I mean, for example, uh, again, I'll speak to my own experience in New Jersey where car theft was up considerably uh, over the last 
four or five months in particular areas of New Jersey. There are lots of reasons why we could sort of speculate that why that's happening. But in reality, getting um, the community to understand what, what proactive behavior looks like, that's all been delivered through social media, but as a, as a one-off event, not, not something that's coming directly from policing systems. There's the idea about transparency and trust, which you know is a, is a two-way street for sure, but these types of platforms enable that to happen. We talked about uh, missing persons with, with the Amber Alerts as well, but also there's the, the proactive intelligence, understanding maybe streams of behavior and things that we weren't aware of because we, we never really brought the right set of data together to really truly understand how one thing could impact another. Good parallels outside of policing where that type of thing exists today are things like healthcare. When we talk about population health, where we're looking at the dynamics of healthcare in a community when people are looking at chronic disease or patterns of behavior that relate to maybe a water incident or something that's environmental, and then using that as, in, as proactive intelligence, you can take that same idea and relate that to a community policing model as well, where we're integrating social behavior. So lots and lots of potential here, and this just ends up being another type of insight. Now, what this does mean, though, and I wanted to show you an example here of something that we've looked at previously, is a few years ago um, at LucyWorks, we, we started doing a fair amount of work on policing data, and there were a number of public data sets available, uh, and this one is based in Texas. But to give an example of, of really what it means to pivot around data, and this is example here I'm going to show you isn't really designed to really replace or, or really tell people something they already know about their own policing systems, because the majority of this already exists today, but there's a concept here that, that I think is quite important. So in this particular example, you're seeing the idea where we've got a secure platform here around intelligence sort of analytics. This particular platform is built to really give you a dashboard of, and a view of, of, of really three or four types of, of, of perspectives on data. One is incident, one is people, one is cases, one is officers driven, and then there's geography, types of crime, things all built into this into this type of framework. But in this particular example, you see we're highlighting things that we, summary information about crime, and then we can look at different aspects of what that looks like on, on different days of the week as, as we see fit. But in this also example, I'm, I'm drill, gonna drill down specifically and say, okay, well, if I was interested in a particular a day, which might be Wednesday, for example, and now I want to look at crime related to maybe a single family residence, I can drill into that specifically. And now I want to look at the people that are associated with that, that particular type of, of crime area. You can see here I'm starting to drill down into a Wednesday scenario and um, click on obviously single family residence again as, as a focus area and then look at the people. Um, as we start to look at those people in that area, we're starting to sort of get different dimensions of, of what, what people looks like in both graphically represent them. I can now reduce the time. Um, I want to look at, at the community of people um, by date as well. And I also maybe want to drill down and say, hey, I'm going to look at male um, white white guys. And I'm going to go and start thinking about maybe how that relates to the data that I want to look at. Um, and then maybe look at different types of crime that are related to that, which could be burglary, theft, and auto theft as well. Um, to give the example I was just talking about in New Jersey. But then I might want to then go and look and say, okay, well, who's been arrested as a result of that in my area? And I'm looking at a geographical disbursement here, but I'm now going to zoom in and say, well, I'm going to go and look at who's who's been arrested. Now I'm, I'm drilling down very specifically and very quickly to people of interest, yeah, persons of interest, and I'm now relating that to geographically where these incidents occurred. But what would be really interesting now is let's have I picked on one person. Let's start to pivot a little bit and look at what I can gain by looking at the incident that relates to that person that they were arrested for. And now you can start to see recommendation on the right-hand side, which is just a very simple example of, of what we could, could do with this technology. But I'm recommending other cases that are unsolved and incidents that are unsolved that could relate to this individual and, and exploring, maybe there's a pattern here that we hadn't really noticed um, by looking at different dimensions of the data. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. Now that's just one very tiny example of how we can interrelate data to create recommendation. But just imagine to go to the earlier point, if we start integrating more social feeds, more other types of sentiment and, and analysis into this same view, we would get a ton of additional recommendations related to incident, person, geographical location, things of and natures or behavioral aspects that we're aware of in the community that we can 
respond to in a much more proactive or operational way that can improve um, the policing and, and the support that we provide those communities. So I just wanted to share this with you because it's just, this would bring some, to me brings something a little bit more to life in this area um, as to well, what this sort of visually look like, looks like. Ian, you know, I don't know if you had any comments on this. I know this was an example we talked about previously, but you know there were lots of directional stuff I think Toronto is trying to do in sort of these sorts of areas as well, right? There is, yeah, and especially um, in our in our perspective, that connection to the community piece is really important. So we're really exploring a lot around the concept of uh, CRM or some of that customer relationship management type of platform work, uh, and this speaks to that. Um, both from a what is what are the needs of that community, and I, I fully expect that we get towards as Simon was mentioning the messaging to that community, and that could potentially be two-way messaging as well, which we're incredibly interested in. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity with that. And uh, and as we move towards uh, a discussion about supporting officers, that CRM perspective from you know, ensuring that we have an awareness about our members is critically important too. And I'll let Simon transition from that. Thanks, Ian. So the last area I just really wanted to talk about and, and get the conversation going around was supporting officers. Um, I've, uh, I've got a good number of friends of mine, particularly that, you know, are officers as well. And, and they're, they're challenged in, in doing the right thing. And, and, and actually the, the scope of what they're, they're dealing with today in, in a lot of different areas globally. And now I'm, I'm British originally and, you know, my, the communities I deal with and I'm aware of in the UK, uh, what they're dealing with there is no different to, to what we deal with in the US. But it, it also comes down to understanding what the needs of the officers are. And, and what's interesting about this is if we look at, again, some of the analyst feedback in this area, and this was a really recent bit of research from Gartner, the technology analyst um, in September this year, highlighted the fact as a statement that by 2023, 30% of law enforcement and police services will leverage insight systems for personal organization effectiveness. Well, what does that mean? That means they're starting to look at really how, what are the challenges of the officer? How do they try and improve and, and support the officers in the right way? You know, and there are various different things we can focus in on. And I know um, a very uh, popularized um, statement or, or phrase is, is blue flu, for example, where people sort of take themselves out of these scenarios and go on on um, some extended leave for health reasons. It's often a, a reaction to something that you know they need better support on. So, given that insight perspective, what does it mean then to try and think about how we go and address this? Well, one way to, to do this is to look at really how we how officer data is stored, how it's um, is collated and used in an insight fashion, and what does improvement look like in this area? So, just giving you three examples that came out of that an analysis from Garner, where you know. We, we've got a lot of data that's stored in very decentralized sources. It's really hard to combine. Again, the same type of framework we've just been talking about can bring that together in a much more insightful way. Um, we also look at everything that's incident related. So that pivoting aspect I was talking about with community, again, can be used to better support the officer and understand where we need to maybe improve or where we need to change the way we're looking at indicators of performance but also where we need to maybe improve training uh, or, or other types of supportive environment. Um, and also by understanding this and therefore the transparency that comes from that type of, of, of visualization and an insight, it improves trust with everybody. And I think, you know, that, that understanding of um, balance it is what's key in a lot of, of what's discussed in the public today. So just to give an example and um, the way this sort of translates in, in, in terms of really five core specific areas is, you know, um, understanding how we, we keep officers happy doing what they're doing. They have the right development, that they understand their accountability, which I'm sure they do, but also in other areas that maybe are more community driven, how we improve their health uh, and uh, so that they, they don't feel uh, anxiety or don't feel as, as, as issues to, to take themselves out on health for health reasons. And, and also then the, the general personal wellbeing. And this all comes from, an insight type of framework that is specifically focused on, on officer support. So I wanted to touch on this because it was just another one of those three use cases we talked about up front. Now, just before we summarize, and I've sort of hand back over to Michael and Ian to talk about key takeaways, just to, to recap what we, we focused on. So when we started at the beginning of this session, we talked about how technology can be used to go and focus in three areas of 
person of interest, 360, a crime search and a community insight, with the main drivers being how we can do unified incident reporting, how we can improve um, uh, the, the relationship of information so that we can get better intervention um, indicators and also make better recommendations on a particular POI type model. And then the community side of things as well as another type of way that we can look at you know, integration of data for, for improvement. So with that, let me hand this back to, to Michael and Ian to talk a little bit about some key takeaways here and, um, and what we might want to think about moving forward. Thanks, Simon. I'll just uh, speak to a couple of the takeaways that we've had so far on this journey where really our, our objectives to improve the visibility and connectivity across our sources has added a level of effectiveness for our members where they're, they're seeing things that they wouldn't have otherwise. And they're also saving the time that it would take to search multiple repositories. And uh, in terms of bringing enhanced insights to investigations, we've we found that just doing one search can bring you in the right package so many more insights than you would have gleaned otherwise and in a highly consumable way, uh, which previously, as, as many of you would know from uh, RMS search functionality, being as basic as it is, you're never getting the key information highlighted to you. It's not often sorted by how relevant it is to what you were looking for. And it's absolutely not connecting things across systems, which we're able to do today. Uh, and finally, um, today and then more so as we move forward, we're really working to improve that awareness, that operational insight and the support about what is going on around me and what's relevant to the job that I'm doing. And so those, those are the big things from our end that uh, we're taking away from this and we're leveraging as we continue forward. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dean. I think also as we mapped out a journey, a maturity matrix, we try to institutionalize a process to get there that the this isn't an overnight thing. It, it stepwise approach looking at maximum impact to gain traction before you get too far. So you, I think as we've worked together, you know, the that, that's been our approach to try to make sure that the the stakeholders and teams educated in, in the capabilities of the system not to oversell or oversimplify it in, in, in a lot of areas. But where we've implemented just the basic platform, I think we've seen uh, and gotten feedback from the audience, meaning investigators and constables that it's a significant improvement and helps them in, in their day-to-day -day tasks. And, and we're just, that's just the foundation. It's not even the, the more advanced capabilities yet. So we're on to Q&A. So if you have any questions that you'd like, put them into the Zoom. And we are in the year that everyone actually knows how to use Zoom. Q&A panel, we'll, we'll try to pick out a couple to shoot to the panel here. I've got, Ian, when did you start the, the current initiative and what were the, these are two questions combined into one, I guess relative then to now, and what were the particular milestones that you had to face uh, in order to get funding? It's a good question. We, um, we started, I wanna say about four years ago, um, when this technology <laughs> would have been a little bit more new to people. Now it's you know, matured to a point where it's more commonly seen. However, four years ago, we, we started with um, really just trying to help uncover our information assets for the people who needed them and, and not even trying to unleash a bunch of data that people didn't already have access to, really just make it more available and more consumable. And so in doing that, we went through th traditional procurement routes of doing an RFP and all of the, the ground research to get to the stage of doing an RFP, launching that. Um, that's how we met MC plus A and uh, acquired the technology that's become Global Search. And from that point, uh, we got funding through a series of grants. Uh, I wanna say we had three or four grant initiatives that funded this. And we moved it from what was originally um, a proof of concept to a minimum viable product 
to where we are presently as a pilot. Uh, and at this moment, we're transitioning to a, an actual capital project uh, where Global Search becomes an enterprise-wide platform uh, that I would fully expect gets extended across a number of other use cases. So we proved at first the, the usefulness and the viability of a search platform. Uh, and then we were able to continue beyond that. Uh, so I would suggest that it was, is and has been a very agile approach. Uh, and we moved again, just building momentum along the way. Uh, there wasn't an easy path to any funding and there wasn't anything that was um, really multi-year until literally just this year. And so now we've got a path that takes us uh, forward uh, over the next four years after which this will become an operational program. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and it's something that you and I have worked together on as the, the technology doesn't as, as uh, awesome as we think it is, as powerful as, it, as we think it is, it doesn't necessarily sell itself. That there's a business case, even in government, to make the case for, for using it and educating the people who have the control of either those grants or the capital budget. And that's something that I think we've worked on together to or me feeding you up information to translate it to uh, more more of your strategy for that. I think this is a this is an easy one to lay up for Canadians. Uh, open net. Uh, which RMS does Toronto use? Oh, well, we use a system called uh, Versidex. A company called Versaterm provides that application. I think it's yeah, used fa fairly broadly in the U.S. Correct. I was going to say it's it's not it's not only in Canada. There's probably 20, 30 agencies here in the States uh, doing that as well. In terms of the roadmap, how, how did you prioritize things along that? Because everyone wants a big bang. Was there anything that, uh, or methodology that you used to maximize what got done, particularly for the audience, the stakeholders or the community? Yeah, we, um, so we started off internal um, that was the uh, key, key piece is to find internal stakeholders who would most benefit from it. Uh, so we picked our, um, or asked if they would participate, our homicide unit and our operations center, the real-time op center, um, two groups in the organization who need to consume information above many others and, uh, and have a highly legislative requirement to do so. And so... From that perspective, we, we brought them in early and they become our, became our use cases. And so, um, as I mentioned before, we took an agile approach. So we started off with just proving the concept. Would this work and would members of our organization use it if we had it? So we did start off really small, small grants, small scale, small timelines. Uh, and then we moved forward with each phase from there. And, and so the roadmap really looks like a gradual scaling of the capabilities and implementing across an organization. So whereas it started small and with a, would this concept even work? Would What kind of data can we put into this? Uh, what sort of work effort is required? Uh, what sort of technology like from a hardware server perspective would we need to procure? And is that feasible? And then we procured it over time. So uh, the smaller grants at the start, we, we procured the hardware that we use today um, and the storage from a, a server and data perspective that we use today to leverage the, the licensing um, that we need to make this product and uh, platform available widely. And so Global Search scales from there where subsequently became a minimum viable product. So it worked, it worked on a relatively small scale and for a small group of people. Uh, and then that merged into the pilot phase where we are today available service-wide and using a high value uh, live data source, um, which uh, was considered very problematic from a lot of members of the organization from a, a limited capability to search and retrieve relevant information. Good. So here's a question. I'm going to change it a little because it's something that I know that we, we uh, have tackled directly. So how is implicit bias such as race being handled in the existing data when being fed as to not create negative feedback loops within your insights and algorithms? Mm, good question. 
We, uh, we've actually turned off a lot of the AI ML capabilities. So we're starting right at the outset with basic search functionality, and we're not driving insights that are much beyond uh, combining relevant results. So based on the key terms that are provided, we're really just giving the direct search results across those systems. Um, so we're not doing things like um, the recommendation for um, people like you, members like you searched for this, you might also wanna search for this. Or even for you as an individual member, it's not recommending things like um, you, you recently searched for these things, you might also want to search for these things. So we're not doing that. And there, there's a number of reasons that we're not doing that. One is because of the, um, the implicit bias within that data set, and we don't want to infer things that ought not to be inferred. Um, and then the second is really important because from an investigative perspective, um, we're not at the point where we want to be able to make recommendations to investigators that they wouldn't have otherwise arrived at themselves through the course of that investigation. So as many of you from a law enforcement perspective would know, as you do an investigation, you'll uncover evidence and the evidence is presented sometimes, sometimes you, you find it because you followed these leads. And so in following those leads, you need to be able to demonstrate the steps that you took and how you came to recognize that piece. And some of the recommendation capabilities, although likely very useful, we haven't turned those on because we don't wanna put in front of somebody something that we can't explain in court reliably how they came to know that. And so although those functionalities are there and they are likely very, very useful, we're not going there yet. We're taking a relatively slow path. And as we do that, we are, we are going to examine very structurally um, and possibly with input, actually definitely with input from the legal community, likely input on those subjects from a broader community as well. And we'll probably develop co-design some policies around the usefulness of that. Yeah, I think that was something that was very interesting and we worked hard to prevent. And that is to say that based on the data and trends, naturally machine learning algorithms would hone in on those and potentially uh, subject people to a negative bias. There are opportunities that we've discussed to, to look at and trying to find processes that some of the best investigators use and then institutionalize it through algorithms so that younger, because um, we had Stacy retire, for example, and I felt like this is someone who's been on the force for 30, 40 years. How can we transition how he would go about the investigation to someone who just came from the academy? And I think there's opportunities there to, to, to work, work through it. But overall, we've taken a defensive position because the last thing we would want is to solve a crime, but then weaken the legal portion of it because of something like that that's not been, we don't have enough precedent yet for it. But that is something definitely to consider on both sides, how, how it can be used and how not to gain the system, um, so to speak. There's another question here. How have you handled the scale and sheer volume of data? Were there any specific issues that you, that you struck? Um, I'll, um, I'll let you. Yeah, yeah, there's, well, obviously like the platform itself is designed to handle high volumes of data. So the, the, the volume of the data wasn't necessarily the issue. It's how do you make it consumable? Uh, and so that would be from our end mapping um, the original data source. What are the things that people need to see? Um, what's most relevant to them? And how do you make that condensed to a point where they can look at, they can do the search, look at the information and understand what that means. So that's probably where we spent most of our time. And I'd probably consider that mostly to be like a, a user interface, user experience problem uh, that we spent a lot of time exploring and working through iterations of what's the best experience that we should have. Yeah, very good point. I'll comment, we have one question, then we have to wrap up. So the challenge isn't the, the search system, it could be appropriate in size. So the platform that we've installed is, has no issues in theory or in practice. 
the challenge is to to get the data out of out of your source systems. There's an old joke that you know SAP eats like an elephant and poops like a mouse. So you can get the data in easily, but to get the data out, that's the challenge. So we kind of have to get the data out. So if you have any of those challenges, it will come from your source systems. And we just have one one last one to ensure reliable decisions and appropriate actions. How does TPS ensure data accuracy and completeness, both in the creating and pre-existing? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so we his, historical, so the pre-existing um, had a lot of rigor around the occurrence creation system. So we we historically had what I'll call a wizard that, so if you're an officer who's going to a gun-related occurrence, you go to that, you, you dispatch that call, you arrive on scene, you do whatever you have to do. As the occurrence preparing officer, you literally, as you're filling out your report on this, you have to, you follow through a wizard. So it captures all of that information completely. Um, today, uh, we don't have that same system. And so we ended up creating a, a data quality group um, which exists in part centrally uh, and in part um, decentrally. So each of our divisions across the organizations or our precincts, um, depending on how you refer to those, uh, they all have quality control people who do follow-ups based on uh, gaps or errors in the data that's been collected. Uh, and then also what's happening now that we've implemented global search, uh, missing information is highlighted. So if you're the officer who entered the report that's missing something that's key, and another officer or even yourself are searching it, it it's evident that that's missing. And so there's, uh, there's an incentivization from uh, the data creator to put in better data so that when you search it, it's gonna come up. Okay, well, thank you for that. And to anyone who has a follow-up question, you can pop us on Twitter or send an email and we'll be happy to follow up uh, any missed questions or follow through. I want to thank Simon and Ian for taking the time out today and the time leading up to this to prep this call. I think it's, it's always insightful to hear the background of Ian uh, and Simon. And uh, again, thank you for your time and everyone be safe. Thank you. And thanks everyone.